Good morning and welcome to this, our Wednesday morning Bible study and meditation here at Valderose United Methodist Church in Mesa, Arizona. I'm Reverend Ann Leiter, pastor Ann to most folks, and I am delighted that you are joining us today. I have a couple of announcements. We have um, an interesting mission project in August called Feed My Starving Children. That's an organization that packs meals and ships them around the world. And so we're going to be helping to pack meals on August 23rd. That's a Wednesday. And you are invited to join us if you want to. We'll be meeting at 11 a.m. Um, near the library here on campus. And we'll take a bus down to the facility. If we exceed the amount of, um, that the bus will hold, I'll take my minivan and drive some of the folks that way. We have spots reserved for up to 20 people. So do come and be part of this worthy mission project. And then in September, we're gonna have a series of conversations and a, a study. It's entitled hashtag BUMC. And that's gonna be for anyone who wants to become a member here at Velder Rose United Methodist Church. But it's also for people who maybe you've been a member a long time, but you have questions. What, what is the denomination? What does it mean? What holds us together as United Methodists, and why should we be proud, not only of our United Methodist heritage, but of our United Methodist future. So in addition to looking at what it is that makes us United Methodists, we're gonna have a chance to talk about who we are at Val de Rose, um, where we are going, and what we hope the future holds. I hope you will join us for that. That's gonna be on Wednesdays in September. I don't have an exact time yet, so, um, Keep a watch for that. It will certainly be in our September newsletter, which comes out at the end of the month. And then at the end of September, we're going to have a blood drive here on campus. If you go onto the Red Cross's website, you'll be able to find it there and you can sign up. There are still lots of slots available, but do know that those can fill up pretty quickly. So if you want to give blood and to do so in a place that's convenient for you, make sure you sign up and get your appointment scheduled. Our scripture for this week is still in the Gospel of Matthew. We're looking at chapter 14, and this is the scripture that we'll be looking at in worship on Sunday as well. I want to read it first. We begin at verse 22. Immediately he, and that's Jesus, immediately Jesus made the disciples get into a boat and go on ahead to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone, but by this time the boat, battered by the waves, was far from the land, for the wind was against them. And early in the morning he came walking toward them on the sea, but when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified, saying, It is a ghost, and they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. He said, come. So Peter got out of the boat, started walking on water, and came toward Jesus. But when he noticed the strong wind, he became frightened, and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and caught him, saying to him, you of little faith, why did you doubt? When they got into the boat, the wind ceased. And those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. Now this scripture reading picks up where last week's scripture left off. So last week we had the feeding of the 5,000. And immediately after that meal, Jesus dismisses the disciples, sending them across the water on a boat. And then he dismisses the crowd. And finally, finally, Jesus gets to do what he wanted to do so much earlier, which is to go away alone up on the mountain, perhaps to process his grief over John the Baptist's death. And certainly he went to be with God. Now mountains are a special place of revelation in Matthew's gospel. And so Jesus has said multiple times that he, as his being a spiritual leader, he would go up on the mountain to be close to God. The mention of mountains accentuates the particular difficulty of operating in the wake of the death of John the Baptist. Jesus needed time away, time to think and to pray. Now, in Matthew's gospel, we only see Jesus praying twice here 
and then at the Garden of Gethsemane, which won't come up until chapter 26. Both of those occasions have special dangers and um, risks for Jesus. His very his life is in danger in both times. And then we see the disciples, and much of this story really is almost from their perspective. They're in the boat. They're being battered by waves. This, this storm, a very troubling storm, is engulfing the disciples. There they are on, on a rickety fisherman's boat in the early hours of the morning when a violent storm comes up with terrible waves surrounding them. Now, in the version I read, which is the New Revised Standard Version, it says the boat was battered. In the King James Version, those of you who prefer that one, it's going to say that the boat was tossed. In the New um, International Version, it says it was buffeted by waves. Whatever you get, the boat is being beat up. I actually think none of those really do justice to the word, because the original Greek, the word is basinine, bas, excuse me, basinine, Basinizo, there we go. Basinizo, basinizo, perhaps with the E. Um, it really means to be tortured. So it's much more than just, this isn't just a boat that's being rocked back and forth or even one that's being tossed. This boat is getting really beat up. Um, and the word basinizo is usually um, associated with human suffering. So something about torturing someone. This is, this is intense. This boat is in danger. It, um, think for those of you who may have seen the perfect storm, this little boat is going through something akin to what the boat went through in the perfect storm. They are surrounded by darkness. And in today's world with so much light pollution, we may not even appreciate what it means to be in that kind of darkness. Darkness on the sea. There's no light. There are clouds. It's a storm. It's complete darkness. And they're being shaken. They're being engulfed. They're in danger of their boat going under. Can you imagine the fear that would have been pulsing through their veins? Now, it may be hard for us to imagine that, those of us who've never been on a boat, those of us who maybe we've never been just out in the elements subject to a storm like that. Well, think about the personal storms that engulf us. Going through a divorce, loss of a child, loss of a spouse, depression, anxiety, the things that really tear us up inside, and the societal storms that are all around us. And we see that in our political landscape and, and what we just came through with COVID. There are so many storms that buffet us, personal and societal, that can feel like they're going to engulf us. And sometimes these storms are like chains that create fear in us and in our communities that incapacitate us and incapacitate our communities as well that are really debilitating even. It is in the midst of this violent and fear-inducing middle-of-the-night storm that the image of Jesus walking on water over those waves comes to the disciples. Now biblical scholars will tell us that this is more than simply a telling of an event or a story. The gospel writers weren't writing as historians or in an effort to write things down just so that they could be remembered as a matter of history. They were written to tell us great truths, symbolic truths, mythic truths, and I mean that in the best sense of the word, not mythic in the sense of made up or fantasy, but mythic in the sense of something that is true beyond time and place. Truth of a significance that we feel into the very core of our being into our innermost self, into our soul. The story of Jesus walking across the water is more than an assertion about Jesus having the capacity to do miracles. It actually symbolizes God's commitment for the care of the very fabric of creation. It should bring to mind for us Psalm 77 verse 19, your way was through the sea, your path through the mighty waters, yet your footprints were unseen. So we're going to take a look at some of the elements of this story and break them down. We've got the boat and the sea and the water, the storm and chaos. It is a highly symbolic story. The disciples are out there on a boat. When the storm comes up, they are tortured by the waves. Scholars tell us that the boat is symbolic of the church. Navis 
is an ancient word from which we get the word for nave, part of a church building, the sanctuary of a church, but also navy. And to this day, many churches are sanctuaries are built in the shape of an upside down boat so that we keep that image of a boat and the church being a boat. The boat of the church faces difficulty from evil, which is represented here by the tormented sea in the middle of the night. The church was sailing against the wind. If Matthew was being written in approximately the year 80 or 85 AD, which is the general consensus, that may have been how Matthew saw the situation facing the church at the time. The land was trying to recover from the destruction of Jerusalem in the year AD 70. And in AD 80, the church was still very small and fragile. It was facing threats, both internal and external. It may have felt adrift in the water of chaos. And that would make sense for this earliest beginnings, if we want, a seed of a movement that was the church. And during the deepest part of the night, Jesus comes walking across the sea toward the church. The image of the restless sea buffeted by winds and rains was a rich one for ancient Israel. Remember the book of Genesis that talks about the chaos at the beginning. The act of creation was God bringing order to a watery chaos. In Genesis, we hear that in the beginning when God created the earth, God drew back the waters from the waters. And that's all very highly symbolic language. The waters represent the nothingness of uncreation. The chaos that threatens to break through the order of God's creation always. And the story tells us of how God made space between the waters above and the waters below. And that it was in that space, that in-between space, between the waters, that God makes all things. So in the Old Testament, we're given this image of God drawing back the waters and holding back the waters that threatened to undo creation. The Bible goes on to remind us of the destructive powers of water in the story of the great flood and Noah. Remember, the water gets unleashed and wipes out everything, wiping the slate clean so things can start again. And so there is this primordial fear of the waters of chaos, that the chaos waters might again engulf the world and undo the order that God had imposed upon creation. We see water, which in some contexts is a symbol of life and refreshment, in other contexts is also a symbol of destruction and chaos. It's all about how is water being used. And here in this storm, the waters, that sea, is indeed chaos and destruction. And so the disciples felt agitated, ataraxophon, or troubled, disturbed. They were seeing a ghost, phantasma estin. They screamed because of their fear, and it is at that point when fear in the face of difficulty threatens to overtake the church that Jesus lets them know it is him. Take heart, he says, and perhaps have courage. Now the disciples in the boat are exposed to the threat, but Jesus is on top of it, literally. Jesus then says, it is I. Now, in that, you should hear that echo from the Old Testament where God says, I am who I am. Jesus, Lord over creation and over that which threatens to undo life. Jesus says, ego, I am, I am. That's the Greek version, by the way, of the Hebrew Yahweh, I am who I am. It's the divine name of God in Exodus 3.14. The Lord God took control of the waters of chaos. And by walking on the water, Jesus likewise demonstrates his power over the forces of nature. The power of Jesus is the same as God's power. And therefore, church, do not be afraid. Jesus walking on water. Does, is this supposed to mean that Jesus can float? No, it means that Jesus has dominion over water dominion over chaos. Think of it this way. When we say that somebody walks all over someone, what do they have? They have power over them. Well, Jesus is walking over the chaos, walking over the water, over the forces which threaten life and creation itself. If we skip ahead in the story to the calming of the storm, the imagery of the storm is connected with the same threat. 
The storm is the waters breaking into creation, threatening life and limb, threatening to unmake what God has made. Jesus calming the storm once again is an affirmation of Jesus' power, God's power, holding back the threat of creation and the existence of all things. The story of Jesus walking on water conveys an even more potent image than just to say that Jesus can do a really cool miracle. This is a message about Jesus' identity as divine. Jesus is God himself in that Jesus can walk over, has dominion over the chaos that threatens to undo creation. There are messages about how God holds back the deep and the waters to sustain creation and all of life. And that is all coming through this story. As you hear the story about Jesus walking on the water, think about the storms that threaten you or that threaten the church or indeed even this congregation as the world feels so topsy-turvy post-COVID and in the midst of disaffiliations across the denomination, not in our conference, but nevertheless, it is out there. We may feel like we are in that boat in the midst of a storm that threatens us, but Jesus walks across the water and says, do not fear, it is I. I am going to leave us here. I'm not going to get into the portion of this story about Peter and him getting out of the boat. I do encourage you to reread that section in preparation for Sunday, but I want to leave something on the table for Sunday and for your consideration. I invite everyone to join us for worship on Sunday morning. We will be right here in Mesa at 5540 East Main Street. You're welcome to join us in person or you can join us online. Our district superintendent, Reverend Melissa Reinders, will be preaching this Sunday and I invite you to come and to hear the message that she has for you in this, our scripture lesson. I want to close us in prayer today. Will you pray with me? Gracious God, it can feel like the storms of life are overwhelming us, overwhelming our boat, our bit of safety in a world of chaos. Let this story of Jesus coming over the waves bring courage to us as well. Because Jesus says, it is I, Yahweh. I am who I am, the God of all creation, keeping chaos at bay and bringing order into our lives and promising us a future filled with grace and with your love. For all who face storms, we ask that they would know your peace. For all who grieve, that they would receive comfort. For all who are ill, that they will receive healing. And for all who doubt, that they would know the truth of Jesus' words and of your identity. And Lord, all these things we pray in the name of the one who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And may you be blessed this day and always.